All right, Bangladesh, 50th, and three, two, one. Untitled Beatles podcast. Well, thanks, TJ, but uh, if you enjoyed that slate, uh, maybe you'll enjoy the rest of this show. I did enjoy that slate, and I hope to enjoy the rest of the show. Is it rabbi or rabbi? <laughs> when I, since I was a little kid, I, I wasn't sure people were saying rabbi Shankar. Is that right? Oh, that's yeah. wild. I Honest like to goodness, I did. Uh, rabbi Shankar, and of course, the, the shank bone is on a Passover Seder plate. So there's a lot of Jewish connections at the concert for Bangladesh. <laughs> Pretty fly for a rabbi. Welcome to the Untitled Beatles Podcast. I'm Tony Mendoza. I'm TJ Shanoff, and I just <laughs> revealed the topic before we even got into the show. Oh, that's a cardinal. That's a cardinal sin, as we say, on the other side of, of religion. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, a, a cardinal sin if you are Tony LaRussa. And now Dusty starts to honor at Tony LaRussa. Ah, some hostility. For those of you who read lips, he's saying, I'm not having a fine time. Yeah, man. Yeah, we're going to talk about the concert for Bangladesh, which uh, the LP came out about 50 years ago around this time. It was, uh, I think in the U.S. it was actually released at the end of December, and maybe in the U.K. it was January of 72. But uh, we're going to we're going to talk about this wonderful triple live album, George Harrison and Friends. Everybody here came at very short notice and some people even uh, canceled a few gigs to try and make it. And nobody was getting paid for anything. Yeah, this is going to be great. Uh, and this is one of those albums that I feel like got lost in the shuffle until it was re-released in 2005. There, there was yeah. a CD pressing of this. Took a while. It did take a long time because of all the legal ramifications on an album that had artists shared with EMI and uh, CBS, Columbia. So this album's had a weird checkered released history that's kind of swept it under the rug. It's arguably one of the greatest live albums ever recorded. Yeah. The diversity of talent, the classic songs that at the time were still relatively new, the experiment in indie music that's a whole side one of this thing. Uh, uh, what it supported, this album was yeah. massive. It's great to see it restored again in the consciousness of the greater public and not just George or Beatles nerds. Yeah, man. Yeah, this whole day, and it was just one day, it had good vibes about it. This is coming off of Woodstock and then, of course, Altamont, which had the stabbing in it and was just bad juju. And the 60s are over and nothing ever good will ever come again. And then here, just whatever, a year and a half later or so, yeah, George calls up some friends and gets together a concert. There's very little rehearsal. And it's 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 really great. And it's so strange that it was out of print for so long. In fact, I had to get mine off of um, disc hogs, as we call it here. Get back. Don't let me down. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, um, I got it not long ago because, you know, you can't stream it. Things like that. You got to You got to seek it out. But I got it for like 20 bucks from a, a record shop that was based in Dayton, Ohio. And I got the whole thing. It's three LPs. And a booklet, a, a 64-page booklet. And, uh, yeah, this retailed for $12.98 back in uh, 72 in the U.S. It's a hefty price tag. It's like a little like Wings Over America when that came out. That, you know, that, that triple album set. All Things Must Pass just, you know, the uh, year before. Right. So, yeah, th this is... Um, like only a beetle, right? Can release <laughs> something that is this long and this diverse. And again, to bring in all those labels, I don't know how at the time they negotiated Bob Dylan, one of Columbia's then biggest artists for the better part of, of the decade prior to be on the Apple label. It, that's that's wild. Yeah. Well, and that's what held up its release. Uh, originally, George wanted this out like a week after it was it was uh, recorded, which was Sunday, August 1st, 1971. With two shows, they had a matinee at 2.30 and then the evening show at 8 o'clock. How soon could you come out with a record after the show? With an album? Yes. That's uh, we could probably have it out maybe <coughs> six to ten days. Because Elvis was able to do that with his concert at the Madison Square Garden to like get ahead of the bootleggers and all that. Uh, Elvis, always ahead, always ahead of the times. I like a lot of the new groups, you know, the Beatles and the Beards and the... 
whoever. It, it, it also just showed you how inspired George was by wildlife. <laughs> just recording, getting out mouth right away. There you go. I get the right. Analogy wrong. Right. Take it, Leon. Leon. I don't think Leon can. I think Leon Russell died at some point during this. It's funny. Like they only, it, there's a weekend at Bernie's and they only wake Leon up when it's his time to sing. Even when he's playing these tasty piano licks, he's dead. <laughs> He is rather hidden. I mean, that's that's the well. You should know this, TJ, being a piano player yourself. Like, uh-huh. you can't walk out and do like a spotlight solo at the lip of the stage. You're like hidden behind all the other. There's like seven guitar players on that stage. <laughs> it's right. It's, uh, Jesse Ed Davis learned those songs an hour before the show. Right. I mean, <laughs> which which is pretty incredible too. Right. Jesse Ed Davis from Taj Mahal. He was going to be. He was basically like the understudy for Clapton. Uh, Eric Clapton was there. Your friend of mine, Mr. Eric Clapton. By sheer, I don't know what you want to call that, persistence. He was like withdrawing from heroin. And rumor has it, uh, one of the cameramen gave him methadone so he could just like stand up or whatever and get through the set. Yeah, he's 46 pounds in this. It's very <laughs> difficult to watch. Yeah, when he puts on that one giant hollow body guitar, he's yeah. just it Jesus. Like going to fall over. It, it almost doesn't look like Clapton initially. Not the Clapton that we've all seen so many times from that era. Like, he looks that that just distant and dis- And it's so tough for me. We need not go down this rabbit hole. But, uh, I mean, Clapton was a top 10 guy for me for most of my life. And even though I didn't love the 80s and 90s stuff and beyond, uh, his his thoughts on things have ma- made it hard for me at this point. And that's tough because I put Cla- I've been a Clapton defender. The mid 70s stuff, you know, I love the slow hand album. Yeah, but it's gr- it, but it, it's great to see him here. And with the weird everything with All Things Must Pass and the Layla album and Patty, they're still playing together and smiling at each other. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's, it's a wonderful thing to behold and very strange at the same time. And though the times have changed, we're rearranged. Will the ties that bind remain the same? Well, the album did very well when it did come out. It reached number two in the U.S. and number one in the U.K. And it got the Grammy for Best Album, which the orchestra had to learn Bangladesh for. Oh, boy. Here we go. The concept of Bangladesh. Yeah! Accepting the award for the concert for Bangladesh is Ringo Starr. Have you seen the clip of that? Yeah, I loved it. I love it. It's just amazing. <laughs> yeah, Ringo has to accept the awards. There's like 12 of them on this platter. I'd just like to say that I'm picking this up on behalf of everyone who was at the concert and everyone who put in the time, especially George Harrison, Phil Spector, Ringo Starr, Billy Preston, Ravi Shankar, Klaus Vorman, Eric Clapton, Bob Dylan, Leon Russell, Badfinger, and for Apple for getting it together. What a plug. All the best. Thank you. We should actually talk about what this concert is for, you know, for a moment, right? Yeah. Uh, Basically, Pakistan had been divided into two provincial exclaves, so they're not connected. West Pakistan, and then there's India, about a thousand miles of India, and then there's East Bengal, which became East Pakistan. And long story short, West Pakistan was taking everything away, underfunding East Pakistan, and East Pakistan was the more cosmopolitan, you might call it the blue part and West Pakistan was sparsely populated and was more like the red part. And then martial law was instated. Uh, in 1970, a cyclone swept through East Pakistan, about 500,000 people were killed and the central government was kind of poor to respond. If any of this is sounding familiar, (laughs) keep listening. Mm -hmm. Essentially, the Bangladesh Liberation War started in March of 1971. The Pakistan army massacred between 250,000 and 3 million people, uh, Bengalis. So this is like students, intellectuals, political figures. And so everyone was fleeing to India. Meanwhile, cholera is breaking out. So it is just a horrible scene. It's a terrible scene. And Ravi Shankar identified as a Bengali. He's Indian. Uh, A lot of India actually... uh, 
sympathize with the uh, East Bengalis and they wanted to be liberated and have their own country called Bangladesh. And so Ravi reached out to George, what can you do? Hoping to raise 25,000, something like that. And George got this concert together. And what did they, it's on the back of this booklet here. They actually show the check. And this is just from the concert proceeds uh, before album sales. And the film and all that. This is $243,418.50. Of which Alan Klein took (laughs) (laughs) $242,418. Right, right. Uh, yes, Alan Klein is involved in this. And curiously, I was watching Get Back last night, actually, uh, episode three. And uh, remember that moment that it's the day after Lennon meets Alan Klein and he's hyping up Klein while Paul's out of the room. And he mentions how Klein was going to take Michael Lindsay Hogg's Rock and Roll Circus and have the proceeds go to Biafra, Jello Biafra from the Dead Kennedys. <laughs> No, uh, the the country of Biafra, uh, which was that was the you know, that's what was going on in 1969. You know, so this idea was kind of out there and George was in that room listening. And perhaps, you know, we rip on Klein or whatever. And he he wasn't the best guy. No. But I mean, he was involved with this thing. You got to at least give him that he was involved with this thing. By 1985, 12 million dollars had been donated uh, all the proceeds went to UNICEF, by the way. So it was legit. It wasn't like <laughs> Amazon.relief.com. <laughs> Bezos takes 85% and goes into space. Right. Guy. Vanity space shit. Right. <laughs> John, can you tell me what happened with Alan Klein? Why did you and the other two try to get decide finally to get rid of him? Uh, well, there are many reasons to get finally given the push. Let's say that... Uh, Possibly Paul's suspicions were right. Yeah, I do have some fun facts. Would you like to hear some? Sure. Concert for Bangladesh. Fun facts. An Indian astrologer suggested early August as a good time for the concert, and August 1st was the only date available at Madison Square Garden. This is the first major U.S. concert appearance by Bob Dylan in over five years. Uh, John initially agreed to play without Yoko, which caused a fight at home, apparently, and he left New York City in a huff two days before the show. John offered another account in which he said he was too bothered to leave his holiday in the Virgin Islands to perform. (laughs) In in essence, John had gone (laughs) tropo. Now, he did attend the movie premiere, but he left during Dylan's set, so... That's interesting. Well, he didn't believe in him, so he got <laughs> yeah. up and went. <laughs> yeah, that's He's right. Like, Fuck this! I just believe in me. Well, Yoko, I mean, Yoko, come on. <laughs> yeah, come on. Yoko, get your coat. <laughs> Don't let go of the coat, Yoko. It's obscure. <laughs> Yo- <laughs> hey, Yoko. Hey, Yoko. Did you steal my money? <laughs> <laughs> Do you regret signing that contract with Klein now? Looking back, uh, I don't want to go into no, the contract no. business because no. it's all. You know, let the lawyers deal with the contracts. It's getting to a Rolling Stone article now. (laughs) Now, Paul declined the invitation, citing Alan Klein's involvement. He didn't want to give Alan Klein the credit for reuniting the Beatles as well. Ringo. This is where Ringo met Jim Keltner. I love that Nora Ephron movie. (laughs) Oh, so sweet. It is. It's, yeah. Billy Crystal plays both? He's doing two roles. (laughs) Hashtag two rolls. (laughs) It really is. It's the Beatles beaches. Let's face it. (laughs) (laughs) That's that's my favorite iTunes compilation. The Beatles beaches. It's just a fucking help soundtrack when they're in the Bahamas. That's all. (laughs) That's it. It's a one. It's a one song playlist. (laughs) Uh, Beatles forever offer. Nicholas Schaffner was at the afternoon concert. Allegedly, Schaffner never showed his ticket. What are you, Albert Goldman? Step up! <laughs> now you've heard Stephen Stills was there, right? Yes. Uh, <laughs> as the, as the uh, SCTV uh, Neil Young parody goes, the doorbell rang and it was Stephen Stills. The doorbell rang and it was Stephen Stills. You wanted to know if I wanted to buy some pills. It's, I think, Rick Moranis as Neil Young. 
singing a needle in the damage done about <laughs> Stephen Stills begging for drugs. <laughs> but yeah, Stephen Stills was there, and I believe there's a there's a great story about his presence. Well, yeah, so he had sold out Madison Square Garden on July 30th, so just two nights before. So he let George use the stage, his sound, the lighting rig, all that, his production manager even. And then he was teed off that he wasn't asked to play. He wasn't thanked. He wasn't even mentioned that night. And I guess he spent the concert drunk in Ringo's dressing room, quote, barking at everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Understudying for, for Harry Nielsen. <laughs> yeah. Now that yeah. year, he, he did play guitar on Bill Withers' Ain't No Sunshine. So, you know, he had a good year. It's all right. Well, in fairness, you can't be with the one you love. <laughs> yeah. I don't know the rest. <laughs> Know what you believe. <laughs> <laughs> Love Steve. My favorite Steven Still song. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm a pretty big fan. <laughs> I am too. I love that he wrote that one. <laughs> He's from South Detroit after all. A couple more fun facts, TJ, before we get into this. We will go through the songs. It's a great concert. But the uh, the after party ended with Keith Moon smashing up a drum kit that belonged to Badfinger. <laughs> oh, Badfinger. They, first, they couldn't be heard until right. Pete Ham got a step in the lead. And then Keith Moon is <laughs> trashing their equipment. Apple build them for it. No question. <laughs> That's why Bad yeah. Finger, poor Bad Finger was so depressed. Yeah. And here's a fun one. Dig this. You'll love this, TJ. Aerosmith used crowd sounds from this concert for their version of Train Kept a Rollin'. I, and and for background digital noise on the pump CD, that's mastered at a thousand percent. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember playing that on the radio when you would come out of a song like a fading out of the other song, and you hit the button on that Aerosmith record, and the needles, the VU meters, just bam. <laughs> Well, those are the fun facts I've got for this record concert for Bangladesh. It's uh, it's George Harrison. It's uh, Leon Russell. It's Bob Dylan, Ringo, Klaus Vorman on bass. Did I say Eric Clapton? I Eric Clapton. I forgot Billy Preston. <laughs> We've we forgotten Billy Preston. <laughs> And the crowd goes crazy for him. Billy Preston arguably the star of this movie, in much in the way he's ultimately the star of the Get Back film. Like he's yeah. the be the best supporting actor usually wins or sometimes wins over the best actor or actress. And in this case, Billy Preston's the best supporting actor. He is his energy, his playing, the whole thing in the mix. Th this is a, a record that is best seen on film. And yeah. the record is really, really good and really fun. But the energy of the performances elevates the performances a notch when you see them visually. What Billy Preston does, and that's the way God planned it, um, watching uh, the harmonies and Just Like a Woman, are they great on record? Sure. But seeing it, the chills you get from that visual of Leon Russell and, and Bob Dylan and George Harrison... Uh, this movie, I'm like I said, I'm so happy it's in print. It might not be widely available, but Apple in 05 put it out on a beautiful deluxe DVD set. And it's, um, it's, I mean, can you make a case? It's the greatest rock concert film of all time with all due respect to the last waltz. And maybe I won't, I won't go get back a concert film, even though it's a large component of it, but yeah, it's maybe the best rock concert film of all time. Right. I mean, it's hard to beat. I'm trying to think of some that would beat it. That's like a concert film and not like a documentary or whatever, you know? I mean, there is Song Remains the Same with Zeppelin, which has all those crazy, uh, <laughs> like, it's like an electronic robotic beheading and <laughs> multicolored blood and... Anyway, that's, that's that, but... <laughs> 
Right. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a great concert. It was directed by Saul Swimmer. Uh, it was shot on 16 millimeters and then blown up frame by frame, a very tedious process, uh, by some old guys in Hollywood, according to Saul. It was blown up to 70 millimeters. And uh, two of the cameras, the footage was unusable. Camera right was out of focus and camera left had a cable in front of it the whole time. So they're really limited. But I, it's a great concert yeah it's tough to beat the only other nugget before we begin is it's george's first time playing a concert like that since candlestick park yeah I mean, there was like like a one-off or two but in terms of playing a show like that that he was headlining think how much touring had changed since then I oh mean, yeah this is this is 71 i mean the horn section george ever played with a horn section or, you know, nope. all, uh, six guitar players. And, you know, <laughs> right. it's, it's crazy. There was an organ on stage in case John felt in the mood to play I'm Down when they were on <laughs> tour, you know? Yeah. The Vox Continental just sitting there in the yeah. event. Waiting. <laughs> yeah. We should say that with all that instrumentation, yes, Phil Spector uh, co produced this record. That's why there's two drummers. Seven guitar players. There's like whatever the however seven backup singers. Yeah, it's 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 a full it's a full outfit. Plus you know two keyboards. Yeah, yeah. And yet I think prevailing wisdom is Phil Spector was largely absent on this when it came to assembling the record. I think yeah. the engineer of this gets a lot of the credit because Phil was in and out of the hospital. And there were birds and tweeting. And <laughs> I can't read this writing. You know what it's is that tweeting way? bird out there? Yeah. From God. Jan Lennon. Uh, let's let's <laughs> yeah. get into the record itself, which let's has it. not been on vinyl in the States. I just got to geek out. I will do this in 30 seconds. <laughs> Capital was going to reissue this on vinyl in 1982 and pressed a certain number of copies. They got rid of the box. It was a gatefold cover. I've seen one at Beetlefest about 10 years ago. I didn't buy it at the time. So Capital tried to reissue it and then pulled it back. There's only a certain amount of copies remaining. It's on Discogs today for $500. It's like a white whale. Whoa, man. And it's not been on vinyl in the States then since the original pressing. In the UK, they issued it on vinyl in the early 90s on the Epic label. So in the UK, mm. there's a vinyl pressing from the 90s mm. on Epic, which I think is cool. I hope this gets a vinyl set at some point in 180 gram here for $10,000 in a gnome. <laughs> Ooh, 37.6 seconds. Better luck next time, TJ. Join us next time on Beat the Clock. Now, how many formats do you have of this record, TJ? They're all fairly recent. Um, I have the cassette of this. Wow. Which, what I love about the cassette of this is the cassette is on Apple with the Columbia labels, which is kind of really neat. It's cool to see a Beatle on Columbia, a la Paul McCartney, George's one time. I take that back. He was in the Porky's Revenge soundtrack, which is also in the <laughs> Columbia family of labels. Right. Uh, the Bangladesh <laughs> DVD from 05, which is gorgeous. I got yeah, the vinyl. Beautiful. I got the CD reissue. But this is not an album like I lived in. I mean, this is one that it took till it was issued in 05 again for me to kind of really get to know. I didn't know this one until my 30s. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I didn't stumble upon this one till later, I think, because, yeah, it just kind of like you said, got swept under the rug. It's, it was out of print for a while. Well, it opens, it's six sides. Side one starts with George Harrison's intro. Uh, in the film, he's in his uh, street clothes, if you will. He's wearing denim and stuff. And he's asking the, the audience to take the Indian music with more seriousness uh, than his music. First part of the concert is going to be an Indian music section. And uh, as you realize... The indie music's a little bit more serious than our music, and I appreciate if you could uh, try and settle down and get into the indie music section. He's a school marm telling the <laughs> audience, and then audience gets lectured a lot. Ravi Shankar comes out and is like, don't smoke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Indian music needs a little concentrated listening. Now, as usual, I would request you, my friends, to refrain or stop from smoking while the program is on. Thank you very much. God bless you. Stop talking. Yeah. Get your hands to yourselves. <laughs> you two, stop <laughs> fucking. This is not music for that. No gum chewing. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a four piece uh, band, if you will. It's the this is considered classical Indian music. It's Ravi Shankar on sitar, Ali Akbar Khan on Sarad, I think is how you say that. I think it's K Sarad. <laughs> You're going to hear a sitar 
Ansaro Duet. On Tabla, I, I, I may have misheard this. Alan Arkin? I think that's who it was, yes. <laughs> sure, you all know Robbie's tabla player, Alaraka. <laughs> who knew? You know, most people are doing sitar, he's doing tabla. All right, man. <laughs> I'm a New York dentist, and Peter Falk, to this minute, I don't know, I don't know what, who he is or what character he plays. <laughs> no, Ala Raka is, but it's not, if you listen to it, it sounds like Alan Arkin. And then Kamala Harris on Tambura. Which I think is pretty bold. Made a lot of made a lot of people mad for no reason, and they won't don't want to admit why. <laughs> yeah, they can't admit it. No, her right. name is Kamala. Kamala uh, Chakravarti on Tambura, which is the droning sound. But yes, yes. I mean, the best part of this is when they tune up, and then they get applause. <laughs> Rabbi Shaker is so funny here. <laughs> Thank you. If you appreciate the tuning so much, I hope you'll enjoy the playing more. Thank you. It gets a laugh. That's ballsy when, yeah. when the featured act pulls a laugh before the headliner gets a crack. Like, featured act, don't entertain him that much. Set up the headliner. Yeah. If you look closely, you can see in the background George Harrison, there's steam coming out of his ears during that moment. <laughs> That's also because Stephen Stills is ranting at him. <laughs> I'm not going to cop out an inch. To fear. And you walked out two fucking days in a row, you fucking hypocrite. You piss me off. I'm warning you with peace and love. Well, yeah, and then they start going at it, man. I guess, according to Harrison, like, their set went about 45 minutes. We get about, what, 15 minutes here? And, uh... It's fun. I mean, it's, it has its moments. Like, yeah, obviously, this is not the music we, we you and I, grew up listening to. It's, it's different. It's, uh, different. Whatever. But it's cool... I like the parts where their tempo picks up and they're trading licks and doing that whole thing. That's that's something that we've seen. They jazz guys do that and all that. Play music and English. <laughs> Well, there's still lyrics, now look, TJ. <laughs> that's my point. You think I'm stupid? Um, you know, one of the reasons I, I really like this, Tony, is because of all the Indian excursions. Like, it's the reason the Inner Light is my favorite George Indian composition, because it kind of bursts with this major key feel. Mm. Um, you know, uh, love you too is kind of minory within you without you. It's got kind of a minory thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I feel like Inner Light's kind of that bouncy major key, and this has, if I prefer the major drone, and I think that's where my ear is better attuned to Indian music, and this is 16 minutes of that. Now, TJ, which album side do you think is listened to less? I'm going to give you, this is a multiple choice. <laughs> this is the equivalent of side four of sometime in New York City. And side two of live peace in Toronto. Oh, yeah. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen. Right. Test, test. The plastic... I was going to add, you know, side six or whatever of All Things Must Pass. As well as uh, Yellow Submarine side two. Yes. Well, you flip the record and you, you like most of us, you probably this is what you came for. It starts with perhaps one of my favorite George Harrison songs and one of my favorite George Harrison performances of Wawa. Such a great version of it. It just cooks. It's such a great opener. The groove is similar but different to the studio version. You can kind of hear how the background singers live and how the oh. crowd it just takes it over. It's a glorious, glorious opener.
yeah, the background singers do it for me, especially. And uh, yeah, especially uh, Claudia Lanier. I think that's how you say her name. She's that very, uh, if you will, very foxy African-American woman who's just having a ball dancing. She dated Jagger. She dated Bowie. She knows what she's doing. <laughs> I hear her voice come through hard on these, and I just love it. I love this song. Yeah, she's almost like the featured background vocalist. Yeah, yeah. She's playing is, tambourine in there sometimes, too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and you see with uh, Jesse Ed Davis, you see him in the background right when the song starts. I, I, when I first saw that, I'm like, is that Ricky Fatar? You know what I mean? Yes. <laughs> right? Former Beach Boy. Right. And then and s- Ruddle. S- soon to play George or whatever in the Ruddles, right? Yeah. Uh, but that's not, but he did, that's Jesse Ed Davis. And, uh, George gave as a thank you, George gave him that song, Sue Me, Sue You Blues, which appeared first on Jesse's, uh, Ululu record in 1972. Don't you sue me and I'll sue you. Swing your partners, I'll get screwed. Hold your Well, with George, Jesse was a friend. I mean, yeah, he, he was a good friend of mine. <laughs> Lately, something's changed, and it's hard for me to find. Jesse's got himself a lady, and they're going to ban of mine. And he's watching him with those eyes. Now that's rock. Yeah. Burn your side one of Bangladesh and recut it with <laughs> Rick Springfield. <laughs> you know I wish that I had Jesse's girl. Yeah. And it's really cool also in Wawa to see George do his little stepping dance moves that like yeah. harken back to that funny bit he does in Hard Day's Night where he <laughs> his calves seem to move, but his thighs don't. Uh-huh. <laughs> that marionette kind of dancing he does. <laughs> I love it. And I love that sax solo. Now, I, is that Jim Horn on sax doing the, all those solos? or is that, that is Jim Horn on okay. sax who needs to call the dude from Elephant's <laughs> Memory up and smack him in the mouth. <laughs> So he may not play the instrument again. This kind of sax play, like in general, this band compared to Elephant's Memory, it's like Elephant's Memory is a Shana Not cover band that showed up because the main cover band couldn't make it. Now Just hold loud, on, like bar bandy. No, this no. Jim Horn is great. I agree. I agree. But I have to defend Elephant's Memory. They are a psych rock thing. Like before they got mixed up with Lennon, they were on this kooky New York psych trip, man. They were like East Coast pop art experimental group. Your generation's Arthur Brown. Yeah. That too was the god of Hellfire. <laughs> yeah. I used the intro to that song for a thousand shows in the late nineties. <laughs> but I, that's another oldies one oh four. Like three in the morning you'd hear like oh, yeah. Oldies one oh four point three. I, I am, am the, the god, god of Hellfire. Hellfire. And, and I bring, bring you fire. Do, do, do. <laughs> I'll see yeah. you burn. Produced by Pete Townsend, man. That's a good yes. record. That's a whole, it's a great record. The crazy world of Arthur Brown, the fire poem before it's worth seeking out to. And I looked around me and there were all these shapes being sucked into the flames and they were writhing and trying to escape. And I knew that I had to get out and I looked above me and I saw a sheep that was smiling down at me and beckoning saying, come out home. That's right. The prelude. Edith Bunker on acid. The prelude. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, 
Well, this then we we go from. Bleh. I have this little note here. LP starts with the evening performance, then cuts to the matinee at two fifty three. Oh, that's the edit that happens on the record. Okay. Cool. Now nah, we don't need that. Then George straps on the acoustic. Says a little Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Eric is on the strat. Eric Clapton, and they go into My Sweet Lord. great to hear this song performed live like this is a current right i mean it's basically it's a recurrent maybe it's not a current current but it's from his last record <laughs> came out the year before it's it's you know and it was such a popular so yeah this yeah. came out in 70 yeah that's right and this is recorded in 71 right yep recorded in, in uh, summer of 71 so this had been in the con- a lot of these songs in that record were in the conscience of americans for you know a, a year or so and i Jesse Ed Davis and Clapton are doubling on lead, yes? Are they both doing the riffs and doubling on the lead? It sounds like they are, but I never see Jesse Ed Davis. Right, right. It's hard to see it. It's a two-shot of George and Eric Clapton, but it sounds like two guitars um, can't keep from crying. (laughs) (laughs) It sounds like uh, it's it's Clapton and Jesse Ed Davis playing those harmonies on lead. That would make sense, yeah, especially since George is on, on an acoustic, so that would make sense, and that there's you know, 45 guitar players up there. Uh, you know, might as well do two leads, right? Yeah, and then another one, Awaiting on You All. We get to see Klaus on his psychedelic painted flamey Fender uh, bass. And I just I love how nimble his fingers are. Like, he seems like a guy that doesn't play hard. Like, his fingers are just kind of barely touching the strings, but he's able to get all the, all that same sound out of it. I love it. Yeah, this is my favorite track on the entire set of, of really? George's. This is my favorite George track. My favorite track is the Billy Preston track. But uh, I mean, I, it's one of my. This is one of my favorites from All Things Must Pass, anyway. Um, but this just it grooves on the album and on this live version, which he didn't do this on that ninety one or uh, the ninety one thing in Japan. No. And I'm pretty sure he didn't do this on his tour, the Dark Horse tour. I don't think he tried this out again. So think how cool it would have been if he'd done this in 91 with Clapton again and instead of kind of the same hits-friendly set list he did on the... And I love the Japan album. That tour must have been mind-blowing, but yeah. there weren't a lot of deep cuts on that tour. And this is... It's right. one of my favorite George songs and the exuberance with which it's performed here. The album track's an A+, and this one's better. You open up your heart. I think you and I probably share this feeling that Billy Preston's That's the Way God Planned It is perhaps one of, if not the highlight of the concert. Yeah, it's it's the it's the best part on record, and then you see the video and it elevates it even higher. It is one of the most energetic moments captured on film. And all I kept thinking while I was watching it beyond the joy of it, Tony, was why isn't he thought of and maybe get back will change this, but why isn't he thought of and talked about as being one of the greats to ever play that instrument because in terms of impact he didn't sell the same records that stevie wonder sold or marvin gay sold he wasn't that kind of yeah he wasn't that kind of commercial artist but his music's just as important like i hope people seeing get back help 
vaunt him because doesn't he deserve to be there? He's brilliant yeah, man. in every way. <laughs> yeah. It's his spirit, you know, uh, and this also goes for Stevie Wonder, too. But like, yeah, there's a spirit he has that is so loving that it's hard to deny it, you know, and that's that moment. So when the drums, when the band goes into the whole double time thing, I am I'll tell you what, I'll go to that church. All right, man. I don't like church, yeah. but I'm at church for that. in that moment and you see it in the film when he just gets up from behind the organ and just starts like dancing it's just real. like jive dancing like fun great Bee Gees track <laughs> you should be dancing I want to say Steven Stills played on that too he played on some <laughs> Bee Gees disco song but that moment is that is like man I got emotional like I got teary watching that and I don't, I can't explain that. Yeah, me too. Other than it was just like joy. Uh, yeah, that's my favorite. That is my favorite part of the movie. That, and I love that he's got that can of Coca Cola perfectly placed on that top of the organ and there. So does Leon Russell, <laughs> yeah. brought to you by Coca Cola. <laughs> you know what's funny is Coca Cola made uh, $24 million on this, uh, didn't donate any to Bangladesh. <laughs> Klein lined some pockets. <laughs> they did kill some wildlife, though. Whatever <laughs> happened to? Um, yeah, this uh, this is stunning. And my mind also wandered to the Eric Clapton produced tribute show that we've talked about on this many times. The tribute concert for George and um, Billy Preston singing "My Sweet Lord." There, he's a much older man. He's not in great health, and he steals that movie too. And that movie's got Paul McCartney singing All Things Must Pass in it. And Billy Preston still steals wow, that film. Everywhere he is, he enlivens and enlightens the presence of the Beatles. I know he had some demons. I know life wasn't easy for him. But I, hey, uh, Untitled Beatles fans, spread the Billy Preston gospel. Let's, let's do what we can to kind of make him uh, as appreciated yeah. as he should be. Because he's one of the greats and he's the official fifth Beatle. I love you, George Martin. I'll probably change my mind in a week, but it's Billy. The fifth Beatle is always interchangeable. It feels like these days with the release of Get Back, Billy is definitely the fifth Beatle. And he can make lasers come out of his fingers. A lot of people don't mention that either. So. <laughs> Billy Preston's the original Marjorie fucking Taylor Green. <laughs> Yeah, he's no, the Jewish good one. Jewish people have space lasers and black people have space fingers. <laughs> Fuck you. I think that the California wildfires were caused by Jewish space lasers. So there are lasers in space that cause wildfires and the lasers identify as Jewish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, correct. Well, then you get out record number two, side three. It starts with, this was the biggest song at the time. And according to Nicholas Schaffner, it got the biggest response of the of the afternoon show and that was Ringo doing it don't come easy. Yeah. Crowd goes crazy. Yeah. Cuz at this time Ringo was the one that had all the hits on the charts.
I, I love how he kind of slurs the lyrics at the end there. <laughs> He'd gone backstage to say hi to Stephen Stills, rather, for a moment. Knocked back a bunch of shots. He got a contact um, high from Stephen Stills. A contact <laughs> buzz. <laughs> Because this song came out in, I think, April. This song was a, 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 a recent still on the charts hit. And what I love is the crowd really starts clapping when he starts singing. Usually people hear the intro and clap. Here, everyone just goes to the intro. <laughs> and then they start clapping when he sings. When he does this live, it's become so Vegasy now, Tony. This is what he walks out to. Oh. And it's like, you know, the guy from Mark, Mark Rivera from Billy Joel's band playing the sax <laughs> intro while, while Sheila E plays drums <laughs> and Joe Walsh starts singing the chorus as Ringo walks out to applause. <laughs> So it's also fun to see him behind the drum set for this. It's great. Yeah. It's a throwback to the Beatles stuff where, you know, when he sang boys on tour and all that he was doing and act naturally, he was doing it live behind the set. Now he's often in front while Sheila E's playing the drums very well for what goes on. (laughs) (laughs) We have got to go see next time Ringo's in town. Like we can go to Michigan or Wisconsin, wherever he's playing Indiana. We can do that. You know, let's set up a table. (laughs) Let's have an official untitable fan giveaway. (laughs) In the event that that does happen, Beware of darkness. <laughs> Beware of Maya. Hey, Maya, you know what I'm talking about? Beware of Abco. Yeah, uh-huh. I kept waiting to hear that. And I'm like, oh, that's right. It's- yeah, oh. he didn't do that. I was like, oh, is he going to give Leon Russell the Beware of Abco one? <laughs> he should have. Yeah. Yeah, they do Beware of Darkness, which to me is a wild, that's a fun deep cut to play. I love this song. It's great that he pulled it out live. Uh, the song, that is. Hey-o. hey uh, Ding dong. Ding <laughs> dong. <laughs> But yeah, Leon Russell takes the uh, the vocals before the instrumental break. That that was a yeah. surprise. That was kind of cool. It's so great, and it's it is proof of anyone's concern that Leon Russell's not dead. Uh, yeah, he's just like a tree, man. He's going to be around for a while. He's had gray hair for like sixty years. It's crazy. <laughs> it's, it's totally. He was born with gray hair. He, he's like Willow from the movie Willow. <laughs> Watch out now, Well, then George does the intros, which is cool. We get, you know, goes around the horn, mentions everyone we've kind of already mentioned here. Uh, yeah. And then Don Nix was the guy who uh, got all the singers together. He was a, a Memphis dude. Well, that's why they got to do Madison Square Garden, because Don Nix later played for the New York <laughs> Knicks. And he, and he called himself Anthony Mason. <laughs> There was a moment if, if I if I knew how to do like deep fakes when they're walking through at the beginning of the film, they're all entering and they're backstage. Like, right. I want to like I want a deep fake Patrick Ewing walking in with Clapton. <laughs> right. And Alan Klein with Minute Bowl and <laughs> like, why, why, why is John Starks with Ringo? Fuck that guy. Oh man, I'd want to just take my fist and just put it right through his face. I'm warning you with peace and love. We get a cool thing though here where George George dusts off while my guitar gently weeps, the first live performance of this song ever. Uh with Eric and George doing dual solos. Smiling at each other. It yeah, is, it's 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 beautiful. It's a very emotional moment. And this is another one they would do 20 years later in 91. Yeah.
And Clapton is, uh, he's not with the Strat. He's playing the Gibson Birdland. That's a big old hollow body. Actually, not so big. It was like less thick or something. But anyway, <laughs> it's a big old guitar on him. Tony on body type. <laughs> hollow body. Less thick. <laughs> less Paul. <laughs> More George. There's More very George. little Paul in this uh, Bangladesh. <laughs> <laughs> What's with the bias against Paul? Is this the is this the shout book? Why does this movie hate Paul McCartney? I got a bone with Philip Norman. <laughs> well, you flip disc two, and it's side four, and this is the Leon Russell bit, right? It's a medley of Jumpin' Jack Flash and uh, the coasters hit Young Blood. <laughs> So that means that uh, Klaus Vorman gets a break and Carl Radel, is it Radel? Who played on a lot of the, the 70s Clapton albums to which I refer. Right. Derek and the Dominoes and all that. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And then you got Don Preston suddenly, well, who's this <laughs> blonde guy on <laughs> lead guitar? That's Don Preston. That's a dude. That motherfucker is a dude. Like they, he does the low part in Youngblood. I want to say about Youngblood. Uh, it's cool to see George. First of all, Jumpin' Jack Flash. It's cool to see George play in a Stones tune, even yeah. though it's a Leon Russell cover. That's neat. Yeah. And then Youngblood, George did. George took lead on this when the Beatles did this for the uh, BBC. Right. And so it's fun that he's playing this again. And he even does the second uh, Looky There. Oh, which, that's which great. Is, uh, which is really fun. So, yeah, there's nice connections with Beatle Pass with this. You look so sweet to me, darling, but there's one thing I gotta tell you. Yet I got me a fine old lady laying back there in that bedroom at home, and I think I gotta get back to her. What is Leon Russell talking about? What's the story? She's 19. Oh. Uh, but his girl's at, at home. Like, he breaks That's her, right. like, I forgot about three, that. Like, three <laughs> times. Like,. And the last time, it's cruel. Like, I, I love that number. I think it's energetic. It's it's a favorite number of mine. But it does need, like, you know, that's when you edit. <laughs> Cut a verse of that thing, dude. And I woke up this morning, and I looked her in the eye, and she said, Sweet daddy, you got what I want, but you ain't giving it to me. I want to tell you one thing, and it's for sure. If you treat your woman like you treat yourself, everything is going to be all right. It's going to be all right. <laughs> Well, cool. And then we get this palate cleanser after all that electricity of Here Comes the Sun. So this is just an acoustic version with Pete Ham from Badfinger and George. Again, first time ever played live. Here comes the sun. Here comes the sun. I say it's all right. Pretty great. It's a bold choice to not have it be the full band. A little bum because Ringo is in the room, so it would have been fun to hear like a full band instrumentation of this. True. This is almost George pulling a Paul telling Ringo not to drum. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, though, I would want some rehearsal if we're going to do that song because it is like those little breaks are you have to learn those. That's not just a one, four, five thing, you know? 
It's one of the things that makes the song so glorious is some of the tricky rhythmic stuff that they pull off. Uh, Pete Ham, it's great to see him play along with this. You know, we talk about Badfinger's uh, troubled history. George was producing the next Badfinger album now, and a good album called Straight Up that I think Baby Blue is on there, which was a pretty big hit. Also, Pete Ham, never mentioned in the uh, Twenty Seven Club, but he's in the uh, he's a Twenty Seven Club kid. Yeah, it's a bad club. Yeah, it's a bad club. I'm not uh, glorifying it; just saying he never gets mentioned or rarely does. Can we bring it back? You know, it's a fun club. Baby Seals. <laughs> okay, Weird Al. <laughs> UHF. <laughs> it's all my bits come from Weird Al and Caddyshack. It's all I got. Tell you what, friends. Nobody comes down and buys a car for me in the next hour. I'm going to club this baby seal. That's right. I'm going to club a seal to make a better deal. No, I'll do it too, because I'm crazy. <laughs> well, that concludes disc two. And now we go to our third disc. Yes, it's a triple live album. Side five, Bob Dylan. Surprise guest. Nobody knew Bob Dylan was coming, except for a couple people. <laughs> And no, I'm not a Dylan expert, but dude, nobody knew who Bob Dylan was before the show. <laughs> yeah, he was an unknown. Yeah, they found him at Cafe Wa <laughs> in Greenwich. <laughs> and that's the Bob Dylan story. <laughs> Did you know his real name is Gordon Shumway? <laughs> Hi there. Gordon Shumway, nice to meet you. Interested in a new Buick? <laughs> Well, what a coup. They got Dylan. Uh, side five is dedicated to Dylan. And they actually leave out a, a song or two. It starts with uh, Hard Rain's Gonna Fall. And it's kind of a ramshackle band. They, they kind of uh, it eventually becomes George on guitar, Leon Russell playing Klaus's bass, and then Ringo just playing tambourine. The Traveling Dillberries. Because of Dylan. <laughs> the Traveling Dingleberries. <laughs> Even if they say you're wrong. Because of Ringo. Well, Dylan was reluctant to play. And uh, here's the quote from George. Look, it's not my scene either. At least you've played on your own in front of a crowd before. I've never done that. So George kind of egging him on like, come on, just do it. I'm doing it. It's going to be great. And it was great. In fact, I like Dylan after the afternoon set went down and like hugged George saying like, that was fantastic. Yeah. You can tell. You can tell in Dylan's performances what this was for him. And to hear, and especially some of the arrangements, you know, Dylan, unlike McCartney Live Now, is known for changing arrangements of songs. Oh, totally. And some of the arrangement changes here are, and again, I'm not a Dylan like head. I know, I know certainly some, but like I'm not well versed in all the bootleg series and all the live stuff. But a lot of these feel like definitive live versions of his songs, at least the best I've ever heard. Thought the moon looked good, mom, shining down through the trees. The break man a good mama Plaguing down the double E Thought the sun looked good Falling down what I seen But oh my Yeah, look fine when she's Coming after me Yeah, he does It takes a lot to laugh It takes a train to cry He does blowing in the wind uh, for the evening show only, he pulled out Mr. Tambourine Man, uh, which is not in the film, but it's on this record. And then he closes with Just Like a Woman. Dude, this one, watching those three harmonize is chilling. I think what rewatching this, I'd forgotten or I just wasn't as impacted as I was this time. I was just so moved. Girl. 
He did do uh, Love Minus Zero, No Limit uh, in the afternoon show, but that was also not... I think it's an extra on the DVD, if I recall. Yes, as is uh, them rehearsing If Not For You, which yeah. is oh, so great. It's a great moment. Some uh, snippets in the beginning of the film, but I think the whole thing's on the uh, the DVD. Yeah, it's great. And yeah, and that was from the sound check the day prior to the concert. So it's really cool. Camera two, R. Got it. Camera one, R3. If not for you, believe I couldn't even find the door. Well, then you flip it over. It's side six and it starts off uh, with, you know, something. <laughs> what is what is this song? Two years old at the time? Yeah. Right. At least since, since the world had heard it. I think so. Yeah. I mean, it came out in 69. This is 71. So yeah, it's only a yeah, two year old song. Uh, Think about that. It, it was already a standard at two years old. Billy Preston's organ in this. I mean, I feel like it, it, this is another different. This, by the way, and um, his take on Here Comes the Sun were featured on a George Harrison compilation in 09, that whole Let It Roll compilation. Oh, yeah. So, so some of these made their way to that. But this one feels definitive, too. I feel like George's solo starts off a little hesitant and then he finds it. And I almost <laughs> love that, like, he's figuring it out and then it begins to soar at the end. I love where the solo goes in this. It's just a great reading of this tune. Much better than the Las Vegas eyes <laughs> version in 91 with the yeah. chua chua wa. <laughs> and I like that version. God bless you, Tessa Niles. And, uh, <laughs> but like, uh, this just feels more connected to its origins, and I love it for that reason. I like that bit where he forgets uh, just a little bit of the words. He flubs it and then he looks around and he's laughing. He's smiling about it. Yeah. Yeah. That's fun. That's fun. Yeah. And he, by now in the movie, he's got his coat off. So that's cool. So he's just wearing like he was. Yeah. He's wearing this big white suit with a what was what color would you call that? Like a brick kind of orangey red shirt. <laughs> For you, Casey, <laughs> and you 90s music fans about songs about... I'll take songs about abortions for 500. <laughs> <laughs> then the show and the record closes with the... I guess you'd call it the title cut uh, and the current single. And the titular cut. The yeah, t- this was this was released three days beforehand, I think. Is that what it was? God, I didn't yeah. know it was that. Yeah. Now, I like this song. I've always liked this song. I mean, uh, my criticism of it is that the, the lyrics are just very... Um, straightforward there's there's very little poetry it's just kind of, it's like reading the newspaper i guess it's uh it's a you know like it's a john song almost yeah i right. mean it, it's it it feels like a john kind of narrative how he feels and what's going on song and i think it's kind of cool it's obviously for a great cause um i like that it begins with a reference to ravi shankar with my friend came to me sadness in his eyes my friend This was not a hit for him. It, I think it only hit the top 20 
in the States anyway. So this was not like, this isn't on that Let It Roll compilation. This is for a single, right. not like known as a greatest hit, but I give it a lot of credit for why he wrote it, how quickly it was released. And um, yeah, I, it's, I'm not going to put this on many like playlists of mine, but this was actually reissued twice on the 05 Bangladesh CD and the Living in the Material World CD from a few years later. And I think it's cool in the movie when the band goes into double time that George takes that as his cue for the exit. And it's it's kind of a cool showman thing. Well, yeah, I guess I could, you know, we can talk real briefly about the cover, you know, because the cover is a picture of a starving child next to an empty bowl of food. And the record company, they, Capital, was pushing back on that, like, it's not commercial, <laughs> you know, and too depressing and all that. Did you see the lawsuit recently? Uh, the baby on this was <laughs> they used Photoshop to put it on Nirvana's Nevermind cover. <laughs> They photoshopped a dollar. Yeah, they photoshopped a dollar into it. And I thought that was in poor taste. I, I, you know, I love Kurt Cobain, but that was Kurt. That was in poor taste. Yeah. <laughs> they talk about it being a big label sellout. <laughs> yeah. Release an album on the same label as the Cats soundtrack. <laughs> Real big time. <laughs> Any, what late was it? Were they on Geffen? They were on, yeah, G DGC. Yeah, yeah, Geffen. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, no, that's right. So Nirvana shared the same label as uh, John's uh, comeback album, Double Fantasy, was also. Yeah. Uh, that and the John Lennon collection were originally on Geffen. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, that was a new dawn. Yeah. Well, suffice it to say, the record company was not into the artwork uh, at first, uh, but George persisted, and uh, there you go. Came with this beautiful deluxe booklet that's been replicated nicely in the CD of this, but the original LP size booklet's great. Yeah. This really should get a reissue at some point. I'm sure to be a licensing nightmare. Yeah. Although may maybe in a year or two, Columbia and EMI will be the same <laughs> and, oh, the same company. <laughs> exactly. Universal just own everything. Yeah. Well, I mean, let's call it what it is, Amazon. You know, it, it's <laughs> you can just order it and it'll come to your your house that day, TJ. The new Paul McCartney record, only on Amazon Drone. <laughs> what, what, how is this going to help me? <laughs> Problem is you can't get the drone sound off of the record. Uh, <laughs> it's like that U2 song in my phone. Uh, <laughs> yeah. A couple little interesting things. Uh, at the end of side six... There's a little snippet of some kind of conversation that happens right before it goes into the runout groove. The only word I can make out was maybe the word crash. Because, uh, you know, George was a big Dave Matthews fan. <laughs> I knew it was coming. Did I? Did you have it? I did have it, but I feel better giving it to you, and I wish I'd stepped out earlier. <laughs> Here's something that hasn't been released. George's version of Hear Me Lord from the afternoon show. Yeah, I'd love to hear that. Yeah, that would be a cool thing for a possible re Amazon reissue. <laughs> one of my favorites uh, from that All Things Must Pass album. And then Leon Russell also has a, a soundcheck song, a, a Robert Johnson song called Come On Come on In My Kitchen. Delaney and Bonnie did that. Is so that right? Part okay. Of their whole universe, yeah, as part of a medley they did. That would make and, sense. And... Uh, there's apparently an out an outtake. Originally, uh, Leon Russell was Leon Redbone, and he sings the <laughs> Mr. Belvedere theme. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Thanks on to China. Never met him before. Was that Leon Red? That's not Leon Redbone. Who is that? Uh, who did the Mr. Belvedere theme? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's... It, it may be. I'm going to go ahead and say that's Leon Redbone. Uh, here, let's. Here, I got to look it up. Gary Portnoy. <laughs> Gary Portnoy? He wrote it because he wrote all those songs. Okay. He wrote yeah. Liam Redbone. Stop. R.I.P. Leon Redbone, singer of the Mr. Belvedere theme song. <laughs> Great show. 
Well, you heard it here first on the Untitled Beatles podcast. Why don't they stick the Beatles? <laughs> I hated that show. I was a Webster fan. <laughs> I wish I was dead. It's the Untitled Beatles podcast. If you liked what you heard today, like and subscribe to us. You know, you can rate us on Spotify now. Feel free to give us five star review for every member of the Beatles Thanks to Casey Baker. And uh, Tony, I wanted to let you know that lastly, a little bit of trivia in the movie, uh, in the credits, uh, Chuck Finley gets a credit uh, as part of the band. He'd later go on to be a uh, pretty successful Anaheim Angel. <laughs> <laughs> Untitled Beatles podcast. Like and subscribe. I had his baseball card, and it was one of those ones that was, it was only worth, like, 75 cents. So. He was pretty good. He was an all-star a couple times. Yeah, but he didn't have, like, the cachet that Mark McGuire had, you know? Yeah, man. He had to get that 1984 U.S. Olympic team tops Mark McGuire card. Do you remember when Leon Russell got into steroids briefly and <laughs> bulked up and looked like Mark McGuire? <laughs> Leon Russell's original bash brother. Yeah, and he would... <laughs> He would hit an F sharp on, on, his, on his organ and his, his little shirt would just <laughs> burst open like Hulk mania. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first. Untitled Beatles podcast. <laughs> oh, God. All right. <laughs>